telling us about concerns that they have about planes um, following them by helicopters. And again, for us, even though we knew the story was true at this point, Prada and I were thinking this is, it sounds like a very shocking, dramatic movie. It's, it's even in the back of our heads. And I'm sure a lot of you thinking now, hearing these stories, you're probably thinking, this can't be happening. This is Dubai, this is where millions of people go on holiday every, every day. And it seems like it's safe. And at the same time that we knew all this was going on, I was watching Sheikh Mohammed, the ruler, and, and, and Aziz as well, on the television. It was like International Women's Day, Emirates Children's Day, all these, these that I now say, hypocritical human rights PR spins. Then on the 4th of March, um, a very chilling event occurred. Rada received a, a message first on WhatsApp from the keeper, from clearly a very scared young lady. Then Rada received a telephone call on WhatsApp. It didn't last very long, um, but it was a shocking one, um, where Latifa had clearly, as you, you've heard from the, the story of Tina, um, was very scared, and the boat was under attack. Then we lost all contact with everyone on that boat, and we heard nothing more from them until the 20th of March. Now, during that time, Prada and I reported the event to various international authorities, from the FBI to the UK Foreign Office to the Kidnap Unit in England, um, and the Indian Coast Guard, um, and the video that we had, um, which you've probably all seen, and there are others, um, that was put online together with requests for any information that anybody had, because we had several missing people and a missing US registered boat from international waters. Um, and then the next two weeks, we essentially played investigator. We found Tina's family, we found Earth's family, um, we put people together, um, and then I think for us, one of the events that moved this story forward, and, and I think ultimately re resulted in the release of, of, of Tina and her, was that the tracker on the boat from Stromo somehow was turned on in a UAE military base in Fujairah, the UAE. Now the last time that boat had been seen was off the coast of India, and all this was public information you could see on the tracking system. So then the <coughs> question was, why was that boat there? What had happened? Um, and for us, during that time, um, you know, we hadn't found them, but now, a few days later, um, there were contacts from the waters that they had been released. Um, and then, as you know, ultimately, um, they were released. Um, and we're here now telling you the story of what happened. Um, and throughout that whole process, we had, you know, again, with, with, with all of you, particularly in Egypt, um, a lot of support. Um, and a lot of support initially, I think, one thing that's been very helpful is um, Ursa and, and Tina was, was the support from Egypt, particularly the Daily Mail, who first broke the story. A lot of newspapers didn't want to because they felt that it was so incredible it can't be true. But, and, and something that we found a lot of, and I hope that after today, we won't get that anymore from the media, is that when a lot of people, and authorities too, were scared of Sheikh Mohammed because he was the ruler of Dubai and he had vested interests anywhere. And as Tina has said, he can get you anywhere. Well, he can't get people in England and he shouldn't be able to. And I think now everybody needs to stand up and stop this and help get this complicity. Thank you. Uh, sorry, quick question. Uh, you mentioned that you are... We do questions at the okay. end. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, yes, there'll, there'll be time for, for no, questions we'll just quick question once, once, we, once, once we've finished. Sure. But um, I'd like to turn over to, to Rada now, uh, who, who can speak about her involvement and how she first got involved in this process. Hi. Um, I've been operating Detain in Dubai now for 10 years. So while this story has been shocking and is shocking, to me it's just another example and perhaps a more high profile example of what we see on a regular basis and that is overall a disregard for the law, a disregard for the laws of their own country, the UAE, a disregard for international law and a disregard for the United Nations of which there are signatories for human rights violations, torture and the other allegations that Latifa described in her video. 
So to me, although it was shocking, and although David and I both were concerned about the authentic authenticity of the uh, video and, and the evidence when it first came in, it's not shocking, and it is a further example of the kind of repeat behavior that we're seeing from the UAE. Now, in the UK and, and worldwide, there has been some coverage on various individual cases that we've seen, uh, high-profile cases of British nationals being arrested for um, tourist-related crimes, financial crimes, uh, false allegations. But with the PR arm of the Dubai Media Office, this is covered up with promotions from celebrities, with promotions from uh, their agencies down in, in Paddington Station, I believe, we, we saw quite a lot of money thrown <coughs> into advertising the UAE as a tourist destination. Now, unfortunately, it is a new country. The legal system is undeveloped. And there are many, many breaches in human rights, unfair trials, that the courts in England and the rest of Europe have acknowledged. We've seen English and Scottish courts repeatedly deny any extradition requests to the UAE based on the real risk of human rights violations and torture, unfair trials. So this is something that is repeatedly um, stated by courts, stated by... Um, Civil courts and criminal courts, both in the US and the UK, we've seen successful litigation in the US for allegations of torture. There have been numerous cases, my, my colleague David included, who have actually taken these torture cases to the United Nations for ruling. We've seen in the US a su successful litigation. We've seen other videos that have been released in the past of, um, I think it was a 40 minute video of, of quite a horrendous torture carried out in the UAE and um, the UAE standard response to this or their, their press response to this was well it's not a it's not a pattern of behavior well I believe it is a pattern and I think that the press is now coming to see that it's a pattern we have uh, David and myself we have lobbied the uh, UK government and the US government and the Australian government and and all of the other European countries who have strong ties with the UAE, we've lobbied them to increase their warnings to citizens because it's simply not a safe country. It is the, the UAE is the most likely country for British people to be arrested abroad. They have a pattern of abuse, a pattern of wrongful detentions, of detentions without charge that uh, in some cases have extended beyond a year and a half. And only when the press gets involved and highlights the situation have these cases been resolved. As Latifa touched on in her video, she said, Sheikh Mohammed cares only about his reputation and in fact he will kill for his reputation. When we saw that video, it was congruent with all of our 10 years of experience that injustice will happen in the UAE, that torture will happen in the UAE, unless perhaps it goes to press. And then, only then, will the government step in and intervene in a case, just for PR purposes. And that was clearly evidenced with the recent cases of Billy Barclay and Jamie Harron. As soon as Billy Barclay's case went to press, within 24 hours, the, the tourism board got involved and ensured that he was out of the country safely. And with Jamie Harron, as soon as the press got involved, Sheikh Mohammed himself intervened in a case of injustice. Now, think of all of the people who don't have access to raise their cases. We still have hundreds of uh, citizens that we're dealing with on a daily basis. We have wrongful detentions right now, people languishing in the prisons without charge, and, uh, and people claiming that they're being tortured. And yet, the British government has not warned citizens of the serious risk of having a run-in, essentially, with the legal system in the UAE. Uh, subject to false allegations, to forced confessions, to uh, detention without charge. So now we're calling on this case to be used as confirmation, further confirmation of what we already know and what has already been reported, but is something that the governments of the world need to act on now. The UAE should not be able to get away with treating foreigners 
like this when they, and even local Emiratis experience the same problems within our judicial system, there certainly need to be some improvements before we can ever recommend that uh, our, our citizens actually travel there. If it's the most likely country for British people to be arrested abroad, something needs to be investigated. We've had a death in custody there, Lee Bradley Brown. Uh, this, is, this is several years ago now. Now the British courts asked the UAE to contribute their evidence uh, into the inquiry of the reports of police brutality that led to his death. The UAE remained uncooperative. In extradition cases for which I act as an expert witness, the courts have requested that the UAE allow access to, um, to, investigative, to um, investigative court personnel to check on human rights conditions in the UAE, of which all requests have been declined repetitively. So overall, we have a great problem here, just generally in our recommendation of the UAE. Now, in this particular case, um, I, I have known Hervé off and on for 10 years now, I believe, and um, he had his own issues previously in the UAE. He managed to escape, and then he was successful in his subsequent litigation in the United States. Now, what, what I find with a lot of my clients who have had uh, allegations in the UAE of financial crime, embezzlement, fraud, they are not going to get a fair trial, and the courts are going to rule in favor of the local Emirati who has initiated them. And the only way for people like Abe, for people like David, and, and the rest of our clients who have had to do it, is to choose another forum of jurisdiction, whether it's the UK or the US, and that is the only way that people will be successful in receiving a fair hearing. Um, so when Abe, uh, Latifa contacted me, I. Again, like David said, I was in disbelief when I saw the email. It's, uh, it's, it's quite an unbelievable story, and we thought that perhaps the UAE might want to set us up or have us publish some fake news uh, and damage our reputation. As we know, there, there is a little bit of an onslaught in their government-controlled media. Uh, however, given my connection to Hervé, and he contacted me after Latifa had originally contacted me to vouch for the story, and given my knowledge of Hervé, uh, we took it seriously. Now Latifa told me that she was desperate for this to get into the public domain, for her story to be told, because that is the only way that she will be protected, that Tina and Hervé will be protected, and anyone involved in this situation. And there were a lot of people involved, because she told a lot of people before it happened what her plans were, and perhaps perhaps not her, the particulars of her plan, but certainly that she was intending to escape. When she did escape, she actually posted on Instagram that she had escaped, that I voluntarily left, she said, due to uh, years of torture and abuse. Uh, the Instagram account was subsequently removed very quickly, and this entire escape and situation has uh, failed to be covered up. And that was the UAE's intention, to keep this as quiet as possible. So uh, when I was contacted by Latifa on the 4th, and she said in a very, very concerning call, obviously, um, Rada, help me, I can hear gunshots outside. Uh, I can hear men outside, there's gunshots. I don't know what's happening. And I told her to uh, hide away and try to send as much uh, footage or uh, WhatsApp messages or any, any evidence that I can use to um, report to authorities or to show to the press. Uh, unfortunately, I believe that they had an electronic warcraft, uh, uh, sorry, an electronic warfare aircraft that blocked the communications at that point, and I heard nothing further from any of the uh, passengers. Uh, Tina tells me now that she had tried to send the voice messages and tried to send the videos, but just couldn't, so they'd lost reception at that point. Now, what I see in this attack is a number of issues. We have, we have the UAE doing whatever they want. They didn't check with the US government, was it okay to board this ship? In, they <coughs> activated their ally, the Indian government, to attack a ship an American boat at sea for the sole purpose of bringing 
a daughter back to a country where she didn't want to be. And frankly, she has the right to leave that country. She, uh, the UAE is a signatory to the United Nations Convention, and that's why Toby is, is stepping in uh, for urgent investigation. But they, the UAE can't have it always. They cannot be presenting themselves as a modern society, and as David touched on, a modern society that promotes women's rights, that has guests and celebrities talking with Dubai Media Office about how fantastic women in the workplace are and how many rights and freedoms they have in the UAE in comparison to other countries in the Gulf, when it's simply not true. When the law's own daughter doesn't have that freedom, and assume the rest of the daughters too. Well, at least Shamsa, we know, doesn't have the same freedoms as perhaps some of the other women. But what we have is a contradiction there, and that really needs to be enforced with the UAE. I don't think that celebrities should be supporting the UAE based on uh, this, this violation of women's rights, of freedoms, of human rights that we take for granted. Now, Latifa was locked up for three years, or th three years and four months, and she's very specific, apparently, about the four months not being forgotten. Locked up by her father in a national security prison, uh, part-time, um, in, in solitary, terrorized, abused, and, uh, and, and some social media comments um, are saying, why would she want to leave the UAE? Well, frankly, if I were locked up by my father for three years, even if I had partial freedom now, I think I would still want to leave um, the entire regime. I'd have no faith that I would not be locked up again, that I would not be tortured again. And I would want to get as far away as possible, even if that took me 10 years to plan. So I think we can see why Latifa would have wanted to leave the country. Um, unfortunately, with the intervention, she was illegally brought back to the UAE and that's something that we want to push now, that that attack on the yacht was illegal and the UAE had no right to bring any of the, of the passengers back to the country. Now, once it went to press, I hear that uh, authorities during the interrogation began treating, um, or we'll say our clients, began treating our clients a little bit better and realizing that actually they wouldn't be able to uh, chop them into the pieces that they had said previously, and they wouldn't be able to issue the death penalty that they had threatened earlier, that they would actually have to let them go because what they did was illegal. So it, it's my impression that they would have kept my clients in the UAE had this not been made public. However, they, they've only let uh, five people go, and Latifa remains there even though she was illegally apprehended from a US yacht, and she should equally, as the others have been freed, be returned to that yacht. We have Sheikh Mohammed, who uh, told Hervé directly, or sorry, through his um, interrogator, that he hadn't done anything wrong. Hervé had not committed a crime. Tina had not committed a crime. However, he did say that they had violated his version of Islamic law. And Sheikh Mohammed saw it upon himself to enforce his version of Islamic law at sea against a US yacht, a US citizen, Finnish citizen, several Filipinos, and Sheikh Latifa. And that is a dangerous precedent to set. While the US and while the UK are selling them military weapons and training their military. They are actually using it to enforce his version of Islamic law against a US vessel and against our citizens. Now, if he thinks that he can get away with that, what else can he get away with? Uh, I mean, in the past, he has been able to take Shamsa back. The kidnapping investigation is opened, and now that we have further testimony, uh, we are going to reopen the, the case of Shamsa, who was taken from the streets in the UK. And it is clear now that Sheikh Mohammed has said to, to both Tina and Hervé that he is, his reach is far and that I have kidnapped you from international waters and you see what I can do, I can kidnap you from anywhere in the world. 
Now that is concerning for one of our allies. If Sheikh Mohammed thinks that he can breach any of any of the laws and treaties and do it actually on our soil as he's done before, that's not the kind of ally that the US should be having, that the UK should have, and certainly not Finland either. It's unstable and it's important that the government gets involved and sees the seriousness of this. If he is able to do this and if he goes unpunished or unsanctioned and we simply turn a blind eye to it, that sends a terrible message, not only to the UAE, but to any other country who wants to enforce their version of whatever law or belief, whether it be Islamic or other. If we send that message out, we're all at risk. Thank you. Before I open up the floor to questions, and, and, and I'll come to you first, as you've already uh, mentioned, it's important when you hear what you've heard today that there are consequences, that, that the process that we've gone through and that we're going through is not merely an academic exercise that, that has no result. There has to be consequences, there, there have to be legal consequences to, to, to this case as well as all of the other cases that we're dealing with. Tina and Erbe both have the right to, to take these matters before courts in their own countries. Of course, we will be working on putting cases together um, both criminal cases and civil cases. We have, as, as we've already mentioned, been working closely with the United Nations. The United Nations is currently uh, in the process of an investigative, uh, or an investigative process through the UN Working Group on um, Enforced Disappearance because uh, Latifa presently is disappeared. And of course the UAE will have to respond to the, to the UN Working Group on that basis. We've also brought this to the attention of the UN Special Rapporteur for the Prevention of Torture. And as, as Rada has mentioned, there are a number of international treaties and conventions that the UAE has signed up to, uh, which it is, is flagged up. Um, we've heard about torture, we've heard about arbitrary detention, we've heard about abductions, and we've heard about the, the very questionable fair trial process. Now, we will be working on these cases actively, and we will be in a, in a position to update you um, in due course as those cases are developed. We will be speaking to the authorities in this country. SO15, which is the counter-terrorism branch of the Metropolitan Police, uh, there, there is particular jurisdiction in this country for any individual, not necessarily a national of this country, who is the victim of torture, to file a complaint with 